Sorry, total chaos. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with Peter and Ina's able assistance, thank you for coming this evening and dodging the rain. And uh, have a small collection of poems. And they combined, they, they kind of vaguely linked to the theme in the lap of the gods. So it's something of a meditation on free will or lack of free will. And uh, some of the poems will bring that out. The first poem is uh, in sonnet form. And I've, I've picked a Shakespearean sonnet form, which is about as rigid a form as you could go for. 14 lines, certain rhyming scheme, iambic pentameter, something I didn't even know what that was until a couple of years ago. And as the readings progress through the next 10, 15 minutes, we're kind of going to lose form and get more abstract, I think. But I just wanted quickly to say something about form, which is, for me, it's intriguing because it's a sort of double-edged sword. On the one hand, it can really help you to get a poem completed because you've got the discipline of having to rhyme it and having to get the syllable count right and all of this. But you could write a computer to do that and you'd end up with not much of a poem. The other thing is that it's easy to get sucked into the rhyme and taken away from what you really wanted to say. Uh, so you're a slave to the, to, to the rhyme even in the end and, and the rhythm perhaps. But on the other hand, Sometimes the form helps you, and some magic can happen. I'm sure some people here know that feeling. Uh, it's as if the mojust, exactly the right word you were grasping for and didn't know you knew or wanted, just plops down onto the page, out of the heavens. And then it can almost take the poem to somewhere you, you didn't know it was going to go. It, it can add another depth to it that you hadn't envisaged yourself, and then you can pretend that that's what you had in mind all along. Uh, anyway, the first poem, without more ado, Sonnet, Christmas Truce, 2014. The lull came upon us unforeseen, the day mum packed her bags and went away. Shades of Christmas Truce, 1914. All quiet on domestic front today. As peace breaks out, we meet in no man's land to fraternize and barter cigarettes. By tea time's armistice, we understand. We're ritual foes, controlled like marionettes. But all too soon, she's back from New Year's break to kitchen sinkmanship of martial mother her half-baked proxy war takes the cake for flaying one man off against the other. Dad and I unfix our bayonets, then finish our last pack of cigarettes. <laughs> Criticism back, other than what is the bardo? And everybody had an opinion as to what it was. Bridget Bardo, the Bardo Museum of Antiquities in Tunis, the Bardo in Barcelona. Now you're thinking of the Prado in Madrid. And, and it went on and on. And I think it's getting very frustrated. So, just in case, it's the Bardo of the Bardo Todol, the, the otherwise it commonly known as the Tibetan Book of the Dead. That this place you go when you, after you die, where you can spend up to 49 days, I think it is having your next life, you know, working out your karma and seeing where you're going to be posted. It's a bit like a clearing house at university, you know, if you didn't get in where you wanted and then send you someone. And <laughs> the question in my mind is who or what makes that choice where you go? So back to the bardo, and I'm going to need Peter to, to help me with this at the end. Do you want to come at the end? Oh, I need you to start. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Back to the bottom. I'm so sorry. We are stardust. We are golden. And we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Joey Mitchell. I'm back to the bardo, laid low in liminal state, as I await reincarnation. Hallucinations sprout from karmic seeds, recall past deeds, hint at stint to come on God's green earth. A rebirth bound to be, I guess, less than desired. I'm mired in the bardo, 
Bravado says, you chose your life. As though Bardo were some glossy brochure. Oh, sure, I say, go girls Tahiti. But births to Papaiti are all booked out. So cocks and kings pull some strings. Life with the Inuit, they suggest. <laughs> hey, I just have no wish to know the 50 Eskimo words for snow. <laughs> I'm gung-ho in the Bardo. Bravado says... You have free will. Yeah, till I tell them my plans, the staff just laugh. I get miffed, they shift me out of their elite collection into witness protection. Heedless of my entreaty, yes, go against Tahiti, more <laughs> urban graffiti. I the writing on the wall of grieving. I'm leaving the Bardo. Bravado says, you're stylist, you're golden. <laughs> but I'm still beholden, a cosmic space cadet, beset by psychic vortices out of control, gusting my soul from this looser terror to terra firma, <laughs> down some boatful wormhole to landfall unknown, embryo cast in a cameo role, hold up in a surrogate mum, erect. I've left the bar. Bravado bemoans, you Play-Doh in their hands, plucked from space, fucked by the fickle finger of fate. Wait, says the devil you know. Ha! Forgo the forlorn, thwart this sport of the gods, connive, contrive to be stillborn. Go down in blasé kamikaze clouds of glory, crash dive! <laughs> I've got to get myself back to the Bardo. <laughs> Did anybody pick up on the looser rhyming scheme going on there? It wasn't very strong, but something was happening. I don't think it has a name actually, but it's I take the last word of one line and kind of wrap it into the first word of the next, if possible, without too much contrivance. Anyway, uh, next poem. It's called The Road to Mozambique. It's based loosely on uh, an experience I actually had in that country. I won't go into any more detail. Uh, and it's inspired by two epigraphs that I came across. Uh, the first one. It's from the New International Version of the Bible, Acts 9.3. So, As Saul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? But fate, it would seem, is a perfect strategist and will work miracles of timing to assist our destruction. The secret scripture by Sebastian Berry. What did behove a virgin witness of Jehovah to lug his sack stuffed with tracts described to Portuguese 8,000 miles across seven seas to meet his nemesis in Maputo, Mozambique? What drove a puta a Maputo, <laughs> bedecked in purple and scarlet, to manifest as the harlot of Revelation 17. Which perfect strategist cast Latifa Machiavella to assist in the destruction of the witness of Jehovah in Maputo Mozambique? Oh, just hear him speak in pigeon Portuguese. <laughs> His debut tour in a land still torn by civil war, ill at ease in his Sunday best, counting down the dispossessed, pounding doors of battered prefabs, mad as a baobab in the midday sun of Mozambique. Take a peek at Latifa Machiavella, slouch, chewing gum outside Bar of Babylon in the Mahalala slum, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls in her hand a golden cup full of disgusting things and things unclean of her sexual immorality. 
Above the thrum of a Maraventa dance rhythm strummed on a battered tin guitar, she strains for the tail-tick creak of leather shoes, an unwanted guest, and an aspiring witness with doomsday views. Perspiring in his undervest at the end of his tether in Mozambique. Oh, he's up the creek with doubt and muddle, seeking shade, dodging puddles, proselytizing in Portuguese, metastasizing his own disease, double think stuffed inside his sack, weight of hypocrisy on his back, on the brink of apostasy, a flash of light from hell causes him to careen. Me too. <laughs> the harlot of Revelation 17, who spills upon him <coughs> her golden cup full of disgusting things and unclean things of her sexual immortality. <laughs> <clears throat> Whereupon she drags him in to dry his clothes, leads him upstairs to disclose her secret room above Bar Babylon in Musa. Spirit weak, drunk with the wine of her sexual immorality, he bows to her depravity, transfixed by scripts upon her brow, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, an abomination of the earth. At her behest, he gets undressed, folding clothes with such finesse, <laughs> need a sin. Best above Bar Babylon in Mozambique. In a fit of peaky, the poop in a fit of peak, the puta revives, rises in the guise of the Antichrist, transforms into the harlot of Revelation 17 above Bar Babylon in Mozambique. Oh, her mystique has him in thrall. Jesus wept, this evangelist is so inept. <laughs> His old fingers and thumbs like a teenaged anatomist. Ah. Anyway, in time-honored tradition, he assumes the position of a man on a mission, transforming to the beast with two backs to pound away on his last door in Mozambique. It's high time to wreak vengeance. The puta pissed at the iron fists of velvet-lit misogynists. Mm, casts aside the missionary astride, rolls on top to sit stride above Bar Babylon in Maputo. Oh, he squeezed till the pips squeak. <laughs> She's <laughs> a revelation, magnificent, munificent, his scarlet libertine. The puta fucks him clean to kingdom come. <laughs> <clears throat> with hands laid on in Maputo, Mozambique. His prospects bleak, the apostates wakes. A sprawl of verge at dusk tossed aside, an empty husk purged in this perverse reversal of soul's conversion. His fall on the road to Mozambique. illustrated um, book of nonsense and I was kind of anticipating something of a generation or perhaps a two generation divide tonight because often we do seem to have that there's the old bogies who like form and then the younger people who are less uh, hounded by form and, and happier to try and find new ways of expressing which are great and we're cross fertilizing to some extent but there's still quite a divide I think Anyway, um, it occurred to me that maybe not all of the younger generation and some of us might not have grown up with Edward Lear, I don't know, but the, uh, the poem The Owl and the Pussycat is kind of key to understanding the poem I've written which is coming after it, but I will read The Owl and the Pussycat first just to refresh our memories and put us in the, the mood for Edward Lear. 
I, I was mesmerized, you know, by his world of bong trees and the yongi bongi bow and runcible spoons. I just love that. So anyway, it's in the dictionary. Uh, the Owl and the Pussycat by Edward Lear. The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar. Oh lovely pussy, oh pussy my love, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, you are. What a beautiful pussy. Jet overseas. <laughs> How unnutritious. Now, in part Otto Prince, the bill for the mince plus the slices of quince causes poor owl to wince. How patronatus. When the bailiff, bailiff disdains upon owl's goods and chattels, the caitiff. Caitiff? Despicable wretch. Complains. <laughs> Can't you fight your own battles? How capricious. My, my, my love, you, you're so quirky. You, you, you did say I will. <laughs> yes, in front of some turkey who lives on a hill. <laughs> <laughs> How surreptitious. Oh, pussy. Our vows were married. Don't pack. But my paws were crossed behind my back. <laughs> How auspicious. Now, in their infinite wisdom, those old gods of yore set Vernon, a piggy, right next to next door. How perfidious. In seeking new marriage, the one made in heaven, pussy now trysts at house 27. How incautious. Okay, so Vern ditches his wife, hands pussy a pin. But she can't abide strife and flees to the agent. How expeditious. Asking, which one's the alpha? Whom shall I spurn? She tosses a drachma. Heads owl or tails burn. How deglutitious. As though they were paradoxes laid down by Zeno, pussy ticks the boxes while Lizzie Uzo. How vacillatious. In the shade of a bong tree, she dithers away like Birdian's ass between water and hay. How duplicitous. Now, while the felines away, the strigophorns play, and the owl hasn't too far to stray. <laughs> How ubiquitous. In their infinite wisdom, those old gods of yore set owls down the soulmate in house 24. How so? Tishous. While his ex states discobolus her Peloponnesian, Howell's feathers are ruffled by his Indonesian. <laughs> <laughs> now Owl's blindly convinced she's the real McCoy, but she's lively equipped, a post-op lady boy. <laughs> <laughs> Now they committed an iniquity, those old gods of yore, meddling with propinquity, setting Romans next door. How unpropitious. In their fallible wisdom, wisdom those, those culpable loons perverted, perverted love's true course with runcible swoons. So, uh, any words for Jim? <laughs> Delicious. How many drafts, Jim? Huh? Jim, how many drafts? Oh, no. Yeah. No. <laughs> You're not a bit fictitious. <laughs> not a bit fictitious. <laughs> That was masterful. It really was. I like the way you found different things to rhyme with Mozambique. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was coming up until pretty soon. It's really in danger of being a slave to the rhyme there, but you know, it's a fine line, I think. Yeah. Across. I like it, yeah. Uh, 
and then my birthday. Did the story make sense, the Mozambique stories? I don't know that everybody thought it made sense in the past, but it kind of made some sense out of it. It makes sense. It makes sense. I remember one sentence that stuck with me. Um, faith, it seems, is a perfect strategy. Yes, that wasn't my line, but it's, it's a good line. That, that's what provoked line. the poem, actually. That was what started it off. That's from a book by Sebastian Barry, the Irish novelist. I like the way you got the Learjet into the film <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It was fun to write. Yeah. 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 Well, these two got into performing, which is really cool. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was fun to do. Well, it was. Yeah, it was excellent, really. It was, it was nice how I mean, you introduced it by saying about the child who being brought up in court, et cetera, and it came through there. Yeah. It was another world, you know, that, right. and it was illustrated as well, I don't know if you've ever seen the book, and, you know, the, 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 he was an illustrator, wasn't he, an accomplished illustrator. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was a proper artist. Proper so yeah. 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 Okay, well, any, any, anybody else, any other comments to Jim, or, um, or Peter, or Ina? Either. Wonderful. Um, the, well, Ian is coming next. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleman first in my world. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like the, the power when you said that. You know? The way you said that. And, and, and you, I thought, as soon as you started, I turned to Victoria and I said, oh my God, is she wearing purple? Because <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about purple and this and that, and she's wearing that. Which? <laughs> I was an angel before. <laughs> Remember? Yeah, but that was before I heard the play. No, that was it was a nice performance. Very, very nice. Performance piece. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, I thought the readers were really excellent. Yes. So um, our second uh, featured reader, Rosie, um, is not here yet. Um, she's triple booked herself this evening, so she's running around a bit. Should be here shortly, though. So um, I guess.